So here's the outline of today's talk. First, I'll introduce you to the challenges and opportunities posed by the big models that we all have to deal with, and this should be probably familiar material from many talks you've heard. Second, we'll talk about our n-dimensional parallelization system and how it easily lets you use a variety of parallelization schemes to map your AI training to a variety of parallel platforms, so it will automatically customize it for you. Third, we'll discuss our efficient memory system that automatically decides which of the many places in memory is most efficient to store and compute with your data, and we'll see it lets you train much larger models than uh, other systems will let you train. And finally, in part four, we'll highlight some examples of big speed-ups that we've attained on a variety of important problems, like speeding up our version of ChatGPT, uh, and AI-generated content, and also AI for science, sometimes by up to a factor of 10x compared to what the previous folks were doing. So here are the challenges, which are probably familiar to many of us. So here, what, I, what we've done is we've plotted um, this, a bunch of points, uh, which is different models that people use. The horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is how many millions of parameters they use uh, uh, on a log scale. And note that uh, if we try to draw a straight line through all of this cloud of data, we get this dotted line here, which says it's been growing an average of 40x every 18 months. Now, if we just look at these large language models and draw a straight line through them, it's been growing at a factor of 340x every 18 months. So needless to say, that far exceeds whatever Moore's Law was able to do in its heyday. And we'll illustrate that by this by this nearly horizontal line, which is the size of a single GPU uh, memory, which is only grown by 1.7x every 18 months. And so there's a very large growing gap between demand and supply, and so we need to be able to deal with scalable and efficient computing to go to many different platforms. So why do we care about these large models? Well, first of all, they have much better performance. So if we increase the number of parameters from 1.5 billion to you know, 175 billion to 540 billion, the accuracy has increased significantly over time. Uh, and of course, better accuracy you know, makes them much more useful. And all of these models are being used in small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, and so it's important to be able to make these available to, you know, to everybody, not just the big players. Now, if the cost of training and running a model were proportional to its size, then of course only a very few very large companies could afford to use them. So fortunately, the dropping cost of hardware gives us an opportunity to train these models much more efficiently and cheaply. So this plot um, shows how fast the cost of computing is dropping over time. So the vertical axis is teraflops per dollar, 10 to the 12 flops per dollar, so up is good of the horizontal axis, and you can see it's gotten 45 times cheaper over this period of time, over the last six years. So this plot up here shows how much the memory cost has been decreasing over the time. It's only 33% a year, so that's a good thing, but it's not nearly good enough. And, and the other thing is that you can't just take um, existing software and algorithms and run them on these newer platforms because you know, and expect these savings because things are gonna break. And so a lot of our work has gone into making these things scalable in, in, you know, in, in lots of different ways so that you can use these larger hardware systems. So this bottom plot shows our estimates about how much colossal AI could save you by 2026 to train the 175 billion parameter GPT-3 model by taking full advantage of all these hardware changes and the cost drops by an estimated $3 million in 2021 to $73,000 by you know, taking advantage of all these curves. And so we want to make that possible. And so why are the current costs so high? Um, so here is you know, you know, an, just an illustration of why we have no choice but to go highly parallel. So suppose we wanted to train Palm, which is the Pathways language model with 540 billion parameters, and we wanted to do it on a single A100 GPU in the cloud, it would take 300 years and cost $9.2 million. So we're not gonna do that. So, and of course, we don't just train models once, we repeatedly do it. And so here is an example of going from, you know, uh, GPT-2 in 2019 to GPT-J uh, in 2021, and obviously GPT-2 got COVID wrong and thought it was something else. So we need to retrain on new data all the time. 
Um, we also uh, need to do inference. We need to parallelize that. That's because these models are so big, they're not going to fit on a single GPU. So we have no choice but to parallelize that as well. And then there's the cost of deployment. Because if there, you know, a company might need a very large, very expensive team of people to figure all these things out, and so we need to fix that problem. We, make, we need to make all of these you know, high-performance computing problems accessible to everybody by just changing a couple of lines of code in their source. And so here is the uh, high-level structure of Colossal AI. So given the underlying hardware architecture that you have available to you, could be a mixture of CPUs and GPUs and all this other stuff, and the framework you've written your uh, application in, you know, PyTorch, TensorFlow, all of that, what we want to do is automatically figure out how to best map your, your problem to all this hardware. So what does best map mean? That means we have to attain all these goals at the bottom, which is you know, to maximize the computational efficiency. And so that has several meanings. So it includes minimizing the running time. Um, but to minimize the running time, we also have to minimize how much data movement we do. Because moving data, communication, that's the most expensive thing, uh, slowest thing on any uh, modern architecture. So we have to minimize that as well. We also have to minimize the programming effort, the amount of code refactoring. So you only have to change a few lines of code and to automate all of this stuff. And we have to deal with the fact that you know, if you're in an adaptive environment, you know, in the cloud, resources may come and go, so we want to automatically uh, update our decisions depending on how many resources are available to you. And we want to use as little memory as possible, because that's going to be expensive as well. So uh, to do all of this, uh, Colossal AI provides a three-layered system. And what this does, the first layer is an efficient memory system, which is to best utilize the available memory. The second layer figures out how to do best parallelization. It's called n-dimensional parallelism, and I'll explain what that means in a few slides, to best map your problem onto the hardware. Uh, and then there's a low latency inference to reduce the cost and latency of the large model inference. And so the goal of, of Colossal AI is to hide the many complicated and interacting decisions to do all this from the users. So to illustrate you know, how interested people are or, you know, in using this, so here's our you know, number of uh, GitHub stars since inception. And, uh, you know, I should have updated this yesterday. We're now well over 30,000. And, you know, compared to some other very well-known, like Spark uh, uh, frameworks, you know, you know in measured in, year, in months since they were up, you know, we're doing very well in terms of interest out there. And uh, here's the number of uh, and these uh, different stargazers, if you like, people who have submitted the stars, are from all over the world. There are about 140 different countries and regions who are using this. And we've also had a lot of uh, adoption from other frameworks. So for example, if you go to the PyTorch webpage, you know, they give a, a link to how to use Colossal AI. Same thing for Lightning AI. Uh, same thing for Hugging Face. And the same thing for uh, Facebook OPT. So they all have, have links to this and recommend it. So, Let's go on to the technical details. And so we're going to talk about how to do n-dimensional parallelism now. So we provide a complete set of parallelism methods, including what I'm going to talk about and explain later, data parallelism, tensor parallelism, pipeline parallelism, and sequence parallelism. And inside of these, there are several advanced methods, which are better than what people are using now, and in some ways provably optimal. So called 2D, 3D, and 2.5D, and I'll explain those in a little while. And I should say that sequence parallelism is a, is a newer idea that was uh, developed by our team of developers. We've also optimized data parallelism because there's a lot of hyperparameter tuning that needs to be done. Uh, so we, that will let you train your model as quite a large scale and, you know, and get the same accuracy as you got before. So now I'm going to uh, present the details to show our, how our large batch algorithms uh, optimized for, or can be optimized for data parallelism. So here, let me just you know, give you an idea of what data parallelism means. So it's, it's easy to understand. So compared to single GPU training, what data parallelism does is it shards, splits up um, the, the data set into several partitions. So here are different you know, GPUs running in parallel. And each GPO, GPU owns one data set partition. The model is replicated across all the GPUs, and it's trained on its local data set. 
And then what you do is you take the gradients that you've computed using that subset of the, of the data and you average them. And then that is shared with all of the different uh, processors and they each update their local model. And so that way, uh, by updating the local model with the, with the global average, the model is ensured to be synchronized across different GPUs. And so the idea is that if we can successfully train you know, more and more, have a bigger batch, you know, in other words, a bigger um, a number of, of subset of the data is done on each processor, then we can get very large speed ups by running uh, more and more in parallel. So here, you know, there's a factor of you know, 2,500 you know, uh, potential speed up by increasing the batch size, the number of data items that we process at a time by that factor of 2,500. So let's suppose we just took an algorithm out of the box and did this, you know, increase the batch size, increase the number of, of data subset of the data you're gonna train for at once, does it converge? And the answer is no, it's a problem we have to fix. And so this shows, this blue line is the baseline, and you can see as the number of epics increases, epics is passes over the data, you know, it's getting you know, closer and closer to 100, but if we use a large batch size, you know, so we can run in parallel, it stagnates, it's not gonna win. And so we have to fix that problem. And here's the other problem that, uses, that comes from using a large batch size, which is that if you're looking for the minimum, you're trying to optimize something, you may have a sharp minimum, and so if you get it slightly wrong, you're gonna be way off from where that minimum actually is. And what you need to do is find this flat minimum as part of your optimization. So the current systems, if you don't you know, change them at all, they're limited to a batch size of about 8,000. And that doesn't let you use parallelism very much. And so what we did to fix these problems is that we developed two new approaches, which are now widely used, which are the scalable large scale optimizers, and they're called LARS and LAM. LARS is, stands for Layer-Wise Adaptive Rate Scaling, and LAM stands for Layer-Wise Adaptive Moments Optimizer for batch training. So let me just give you some illustrations. So um, this is an example of uh, training the uh, VIT uh, model, a vision transformer model, and on going from one GPU to 200 GPUs, and with the batch size going from 128 to 32,000 at a time, and that, meant that we sped up from taking 73 hours to converge to 0.68 hours to converge. So that's a speed up of, of you know, 50% efficiency, a factor of 100. And so, and we got just as accurate an answer as before. So these have had significant impact and they're widely adopted in industry. Um, by using LAM, we could uh, uh, scale the batch size of BERT pre-training up to 64,000 without losing any accuracy. And that got us to reduce the BERT training time from three days down to 76 minutes. And since then, many industries have adopted it. So you can see here's all the world's records sent for uh, ImageNet training. And you know, after we you know, figured out how to do LARS, and everybody's used it since then. And so all these other companies have already adopted LARS and LAM. And in fact, it's part of MLPerf, so which is sort of the industry standard benchmark. And so this is also part of Colossal AI. And you may be using it already just because <laughs> It's out there. So now, besides data parallelism, let's talk about model parallelism, where the model is so large, you also have to spread it out across a bunch of processors. And so there are the two most popular techniques to, use to do model parallelism, where I'm taking the model here and splitting it over here over two processors. There's something called tensor parallel and pipeline parallel. And so what I need to uh, do is describe those for you. So here is an example of how the existing systems deal with this. So the two most famous systems in the open source community are NVIDIA's Megatron LM and Microsoft's DeepSpeed. So what Megatron LM does is it takes your data, this matrix if you like, um, and it splits it in one way and then it, it gives half of it to one processor, half of it to another, and so you've divided up the work of that huge matrix multiply, which is where all the time is spent, across two processors. So, and, and so this lets you scale up. And I should say also that Microsoft's DeepSpeed is compatible with NVIDIA's Megatron LM. And it also improves the data parallel training through its zero redundancy optimizer, which I'll tell you later about you know, how we improve on that as well. So, um, in Colossal AI, we provide that particular system, that's called 1D parallelism, but we also provide these more advanced methods which can go much, much faster. 
And in fact, we can prove that they are optimal in a certain sense of how much data has to be moved. So let me uh, just draw some pictures here. So this is the 1D parallelism. What I'm going to do is take the weights, and if I have two processors, I'll split it into two parts and send half the weights to one and half the weights to the other. Um, but when we do these other kinds of parallelism, what we're going to do is shard uh, the inputs and the outputs along more tensor dimensions, as shown in the diagram here. So you can look at each subset of uh, this square, the cube, represents part of the data or the work that can be assigned to a different processor. So for example, you can think of these cubes over here as representing the space indexed by the three nested loops of matrix multiply. And so, you know, what, uh, and so in particular, that means a color, this colored subset, you know, let's say, say I have the, uh, the yellow processor, that is assigned this subset of all the processors and this subset of the nested loops that it's assigned to do. And so just a little bit more detail, this is, you know, I think I don't have, you know, so this is sort of a, more of a backup slide. So if, suppose I have four processors, I can split A along both the dimensions into four little subsquares, B into four little subsquares, and C. And so each processor is going to be assigned a subset of C. So C11 will go to one processor if I have four, four GPUs. And then that processor will be responsible for doing, you know, all the little matrix multiplies, you know, that block times that block to update that one. And so that's where the communication comes from. You know, whoever owns that block needs to send it to that processor. Whoever owns that block needs to send it to that processor. And if we have, if, if we are only allowed to have one copy of all the data spread out across all the processors, then that is provably optimal in the sense it moves the minimum amount of data that's necessary. And this has been known for a long time. It's the classical summa matrix multiply algorithm. Now, on the other hand, if we have enough memory to store more than one copy of the, of the data, uh, A, B, and C, then there's another algorithm, which, is, which we call 2.5D, which is shown on the right, that breaks up each of the three nested loops defining matrix multiply, replicates the matrices A, B, and C as often as the memory permits, up to a limit, and then it has different processors contribute, uh, compute different contributions to the final C matrix, which you finally all add up at the end. And this reduces the communication costs even further, beating summa by a factor that grows with the number of replicas in A, B, and C, and you know, that we have memory for. And we can also prove that this is optimal. It minimizes the amount of data that has to be moved around. And that's, and I should say, I'm not gonna you know, go into more mathematical detail, but there's a, there are backup slides with all of the uh, lower bounds stated. So here's some, uh, some scaling results. And so this is called strong scaling. So that means I have a fixed problem size and I just keep adding processors. And these were conducted on a Moexena server, which has 200 GPU nodes with four NVIDIA A100 GPUs per node. And we, tried, we did this experiment with one, two, four, eight, et cetera, up to 16 nodes. And so the number of GPUs going from one to 64. And so what we're doing is we're showing, uh, we're comparing both forward and backward time per batch, so lower is better. And we're also comparing throughput, and so higher is better. And so if we just look at the lines with 64 GPUs, which I've uh, color coded here, you can see that we beat Megatron, you know, hands down all the time, and 2.5D beats 2D, and this is factor here is a factor of about 1.4, and the throughput has gone up here, you can see, uh, by a factor of two. And so this is a strong scaling setting. And there's a similar result for weak scaling, where you double the number of processors, you double the problem size, because you have that much more memory available, and we also get uh, you know, similar speed up. So 2.5D is you know, you know, part of the design space. And we will choose the right number of replicas depending on your hardware, you know, depending on how much memory you have. OK, so let's get on to sequence parallelism. And it's not just the model that's getting bigger, which is what I was talking about before. The data is getting bigger, too. So a long sequence is very common in real-world applications. So for example, articles and images and amino acid sequences, you know, we work with a company doing that, may have more than 10,000 tokens you know, in, a, in a particular sequence. And, and today, even though biggest networks trained on massive clusters of GPUs, you know, they're sort of been limited to between 500 to 2,000 tokens in, in you know, one particular sequence. And as shown in the figure, if we let the number of sequences grow, then the accuracy gets better. So we would like to be able to deal with longer sequences. But there is an obstacle to doing that. 
Uh, and that's because when we're training a model, the memory is consumed by you know, the number of you know, model and optimizer states. And well, in the input data and activation states, those are going to vary with the, the data dimensions, such as batch size and sequence length. And so here, um, we use the transformer model GPTJ as an example. And these axes are logarithmic. This is the sequence length. This is a requ requested memory. And you can see that the uh, space complexity grows quadratically with the sequence length. It doesn't matter until you get up to here. You're dominated by you know, model states. But here, you have this, you know, the square of the sequence length, which is starting to dominate. And so what we need to do is we want to be able to train models with long sequences, even though our hardware is limited. We just can't do that. And so what, we're gonna, what we've proposed is something called sequence parallelism, to reduce the memory footprint caused by large data. And so sequence parallelism, what that does is it splits a full-length sequence data into subsequences, and each device only holds a single subsequence. So that reduces the memory burden on a single device, you know, by a factor of how many devices you have. So this means that a model can be trained on a longer sequence, which a single GPU could not accommodate. And this is, uh, we've used this in particular for speeding up AlphaFold, which is used in the biomedical industry for you know, analyzing uh, amino acid sequences. And so what does it do? Um, so in sequence parallelism, since each device holds a subsequence of the entire data, what we need to do is communicate and pass around the, you know, the subset of keys around in a circle, and this is called uh, a ring uh, self-attention network. And this was inspired by you know, a computer science algorithm called ring all reduce. And so what we do is we pass the key around to the neighbor, the key around to the neighbor, and then whenever a new key arrives, we you know, uh, multiply it by the local queries and update the results. So even though the original sequence is split and, and allocated to a lot of different computing devices, the final result is still equal to what you would have gotten if it were all in one processor. So here are some uh, performance results. Um, so we get up to 1.5. So this is uh, comparing it with Megatron LM. And we get up to 1.5 uh, times faster training and also the ability to do 50% longer sequence length. Um, versus uh, Megatron LM. And I should say that this technique has now been adopted by Megatron LM uh, to reduce their memory uh, bottleneck. And they cite us in their paper on archive. So all of these techniques may seem somewhat uh, complicated to use. And so, and so the, it seems like we still have the problem of having a team of experts to, uh, to optimize your code. So we're dealing with that by developing autoparallelism. And so this feature provides the capability to automatically uh, optimize your whole model with a combination of all the things I just presented, as well as our own version of zero redundancy optimization, which I'll get to next, but you know, we also improved on that. And we also deal with activation checkpointing. There's, there's a large list of optimizations which are optimizing. So how does this high-level system work? So this is the flow uh, that our auto parallelizer does. So the first thing that we do is we trace the whole computation uh, graph for the source code. So we figure out you know, what work needs to be done. We assign a cost to it. Then we run an optimizer um, by traversing the graph, and we search for the optimal parallel strategies for each node in the graph to minimize the sum of the compute time and the, uh, and the data movement time, the communication time. Then we take that strategy and we annotate uh, that to each node, and we do the appropriate sharding, moving data around to, to implement that automatically for you. And finally, we execute it uh, on, you know, on whatever hardware that you happen to have. So the whole process is automatic, and it, it, we can also update it as your, as your needs change, and maybe your model is not you know, constant over time. And this whole thing just takes inserting one or two lines of code, and all of those complicated mathematical decisions are done for you automatically. And if you are a bit of an expert, we also enable customization of search strategies for extensibility. OK, so that's all I wanted to say about the parallelism parts. So now I want to go on to uh, using memory more efficiently. So let me just give you a general idea of what all the different memory parts are in a heterogeneous system. So as the GPU, which is going to do most of the compute, has limited memory to accommodate a large scale method, we can use the CPU memory. And we can also use the non-volatile memory of the disk to make room for the model storage. 
And so what we want to do is figure out how to appropriately swap data among all of these different platforms uh, during runtime. And so we're only going to keep whatever we need to use for the next step inside the GPU memory, and that'll let us accommodate much larger models. And so, again, people have had to deal with this for a while. So let me tell you what an existing solution is, which is the zero redundancy uh, optimizer, uh, which is in Microsoft DeepSpeed. So if we, so in, 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 in data parallel training, so if each device holds a full copy of the model weights, the gradients, uh, these are all different color coded, um, and the optimizer states, then you know, that would be a huge amount of memory. And so what DeepSpeed does is it partitions and distributes the model parameters you know, over multiple different GPUs, uh, eliminating um, you know, memory redundancy. And it also supports temporarily offloading the model parameters to the CPU and the, uh, and the disk, so that lets the GPU accommodate larger models. And so here you can see, for example, you know, that you know, when we partition the green stuff, you know, which are the parameters, then each uh, GPU is only going to own a little slice of it. And finally, you know, if we partition them all that way, then we get this maximal savings. But what zero offloading did, it used a static strategy to offload the tensors to the CPU and the disks when the tensor finished computation. But this has led to wasted memory space. So here's sort of a picture where the, the you know, the, uh, Time is on the horizontal axis, so we do the forward pass, the backward pass, the optimization, and the vertical uh, axis is saying what is stored in which memory, either GPU or CPU. And you can see its decision making wasted all of this space, you know, you know, which could have been used for something else, and it wasted this uh, GPU memory. So the total memory required was larger than necessary. And so, unlike deep speed, our offloading system is built on the concept of something called chunk-based memory management. So what we have is a set of consecutive parameters are stored in a chunk. And, and the system, the name of our system is called Gemini. And so what we do is we move chunks around, uh, you know, in, in smaller granularity to collectively manage, manage the tensor movement and sort of minimize it and, you know, make sure we use all the memory as possible. And since the chunks are reasonably large, the bandwidth utilization is still, uh, you know, we still get good memory bandwidth. And so here is an example of, uh, what we can do to uh, you know, improve on uh, deep speed. So during the first few steps of training, what Gemini does is it traces the memory usage automatically at different points uh, during the training step and automatically generates a strategy to decide what should be, which chunks to move between the CPU and the GPU and when to do it. And so when the GPU memory is not enough, uh, it can evict more chunks to the CPU to avoid out of memory errors. And so here is you know, what deep speed would have done here. This is you know, asking for more memory than is available. And whereas you know, we can you know, evict those up to the CPU and avoid that uh, out of memory error. And so that means that colossal AI can handle situations that deep speed uh, cannot. Um, on the other hand, sometimes you have the situation when the CPU memory is not enough. And so we can evict fewer chunks to the CPU and keep more chunks than the GPU if that's the right thing to do. And this can avoid different kinds of out-of-memory errors, but also speed up training by using the GPU memory more effectively. And then, as I said in the later steps, we'll use this you know, collective memory usage information and generated data movement strategy to very finely control exactly what should move uh, where and when. And, uh, and, and again, we can handle uh, situations uh, that deep speed cannot. So here's some uh, performance results. And so here we go from PyTorch through various examples of deep speed to colossal AI. Here's uh, the model size that we can deal with. And you can see that colossal AI can run up to 120 times larger uh, model than PyTorch can do, and up to a three times larger uh, than, uh, than uh, deep speed can do, uh, even using the disk. And this is all running on a single GPU, a single cheap GPU. So it gives you that, those benefits there as well. And this shows you know, similar data uh, in a slightly different way comparing with deep speed. Uh, the vertical axis is throughput, so up is good. And you can see that you know, as we're increasing uh, the number, uh, the model size up to 12 billion, you know, we're, we're still getting, you know, succeeding, but uh, deep speed has failed, you know, has, has out of memory errors by the time the model gets so large. Okay, so 
those are the two main uh, optimization systems that are built in. And so now I want to move on and give you some benchmarking use cases. So regarding large AI model training, we can see how much uh, GPT-2 benefits from the n-dimensional parallelism system. And we can uh, train up to a 24 times larger model on the same hardware compared to PyTorch. And we get over a 3x acceleration compared with DeepSpeed. And this particular hardware configuration uh, is an uh, 80 gigabyte A100. And, so the, and this is one GPU, two GPUs, four GPUs. So you know, we can do bigger and bigger things. So that was a training benchmark. Here's an inference benchmark. And uh, so one major problem of the, the existing inference solutions is they don't usually provide, or they have poor support, to run large-scale models that cannot be accommodated in a single GPU. So what Colossal AI Inference Module enables is a efficient parallel inference for large-scale models, and it provides a bunch of uh, examples that are already built in, so you don't have to do any work. So in particular, this is an example of Big Science Bloom, which is a model that uh, people like to use. So you can just use it out of the box. It also hides the detailed parallel runtime implementation, so the user feels like you're just writing a code for a single GPU for inference, and all the parallelism is hidden. Uh, it's also integrated with an HTTP service, so the user can just deploy it very quickly. So we also provide a dedicated Bloom recipe integrated with the Bits and Bytes library, and so this allows you to use a very efficient int8 uh, quantization, if that's what your hardware does most efficiently. Uh, and that allows deployment of large model inference services, you know, as with Bloom, which is 175 billion parameters. Uh, and you can, and it lets you use small GPU servers using consumer grade graphics cards, like a 3090. You don't need an A100. And so that uh, lowers the cost significantly if you can just use consumer grade GPUs. So another example uh, where this has worked well is multimodal AI applications, which are a hot topic. Uh, generating, so you can take, you know, for example, textually generated images, you know, with examples like stable diffusion and Dolly and so forth. So we provide a stable diffusion model recipe. So to, it enables low cost training, fine tuning, and inference. So we reduce the memory requirement for using stable diffusion with a global batch size of 64 um, from uh, a need of 64 and a half uh, gigabytes down to 11.6, and that's a 5.6x reduction in memory. And the hardware cost can be reduced significantly up to a factor of 46 by using these cheap GPUs instead of the expensive A100 GPUs. And so these uh, benefits can be extended to a single or multiple GPUs running in parallel. So here's another example um, so of running um, stable diffusion uh, using int8, that instead of uh, 32-bit floating point, that reduces the memory cost from 7.6 gigabytes down to 3.1, which is a factor of 2.5. And you, know, you can look at these pictures and see there's sort of a minimal performance loss. You know, slightly different looking horse, but it's still, you know, that's up to you. So Dream Booth is a method to personalize text-to-image models like Stable Diffusion, giving just a few images, like three to five, of a subject. So by using um, model data in the CPU and GPU, and moving the data to the computing device when necessary, our memory management system, Gemini, that I talked about before, uh, can break through the GPU memory wall by using both the CPU and GPU memory at the same time. So with Colossal AI, we can use, we only need four gigabytes of GPU memory, which makes it much friendlier you know, for users you know, who don't need to buy a big expensive GPU to do it. And the, uh, the original version required 16 gigabytes of memory. Okay, so let's get on to you know, our version of ChatGPT, uh, which is obviously a hot topic these days, and which uses you know, RLHF, you know, reinforcement learning from human feedback. And so the question is, how does all this, how do we deal with you know, all the different levels of modeling? So just to remind you a little bit of what you know, training involves here, so training ChatGPT has three stages. In the first stage, you sample prompts from data sets and collect human responses, which and in turn, you can use to those to fine-tune uh, fine the trained large language models. In the second stage, 
we sample prompts from data sets and let the large language models uh, generate multiple responses, which are again ranked by humans. And then with these rankings, you can train a reward model that simulates human evaluations uh, for these model-generated contents. And then in the third stage, based on the you know, supervised fine-tuning model from the first stage and the reward model from the second, we use reinforcement learning, you know, PPO, proximal policy optimization, to further fine-tune the models. And so the challenging nature of training chat GPT comes from its use of reinforcement learning, stage two, that entails the updates of multiple models at the same time. So far, I've only been talking about you know, how do you optimize one model at a time. So for example, when using PPO, that, ha that has an actor-critic reinforcement learning mode. We need to do the forward and backward operations for both the actor model and the critic model. And that's separate from the forward operations for SFT and the reward models. So if you look at the paper on Instruct GPT, where they talked about how all this works, um, both the actor and the SFT models used 175 billion uh, uh, parameter GPT-3 pre-trained models, while the critic and reward models used 60 billion parameter models. So if you add up all those numbers, it seems like you need uh, 3.6 terabytes of data of GPU memory in order to run this, which translates to a lot of expensive GPUs. And so, of course, ChatGPT is costly and closed source. So we're happy to uh, announce that we have an open source version that is very close to the original ChatGPT technology. Of course, we'd heard, we've heard about many others of these. But it has the complete RLHF process, and it's called Colossal Chat. And we only need 10 billion parameters, and the RLHF fine-tuning is based on a large language model. So we can master bilingual capabilities sing, similar to ChatGPT in uh, 3.5. So here, you can ask a question, I'm going to Singapore, do you have any recommendations on the places to visit? And it does you know, a good job of you know, answering your question. And our open source solution, which you can feel free to download, includes data, training, inference, and evaluation. So it's sort of the whole life cycle of ChatGPT. So here's some performance results on doing this. So we want to compare it to PyTorch. And um, so in particular, we're going to use PyTorch DDP, which is short for Distributed Data Parallel. And it's memory limited. It can only run up to the G GPT-2L model, which limits you to 700 million parameters. So these tests are a little artificial. We conducted them on an A100 server with eight GPUs, assuming that the four models in the RLHF stage were of the same size, 700 megabytes. So the actor, critic, SFT, and reward. And so you can see that uh, Colossal AI has a definitely a better throughput than uh, PyTorch in all of these situations, whether I use one, you know, four, or eight GPUs. And so here, for um, uh, inference, it's about 1.4 times faster. And for training, it's about 7.7 .7 times faster. We also tested the maximum model that can be run on a single card. So on a consumer grade GPU, even the smallest GPT model gives you an out of memory error. Uh, and so, so we moved up and we used an AWS PD4E node, which is an 80 gig A100 plus one terabyte of memory. And that lets us train Colossal AI can do up to eight billion parameters. And that's 10 times larger than what PyTorch DDP can do, which is you know, 0.78 billion parameters. So Colossal AI significantly reduces the replication cost of ChatGPT. So here is just another example. Um, we can improve, uh, so this is using deep speed uh, on that same model versus Colossal Chat, and there's about a 10x speed up. And here's some just uh, examples. You, know, you can do Q&A. You know, you can translate, it understands Chinese very well. So, you know, this is a very realistic model. And it also has writing and coding capabilities, so you can ask it to write a letter of recommendation or a quick sort algorithm. And uh, when you compare it to Alpaca, uh, we think it does a better job. So that's maybe up to you. Uh, but we've, uh, how do you evaluate these things? Well, we also put a lot of effort into building an evaluation data set and associated evaluation criterion and a benchmark to give us a scientific basis for comparing different foundation models. And hopefully this will let us and you choose the best one for further fine tuning. I won't go into the details, it's all online. So I wanna close 
uh, I guess I have a few minutes left, with one more example, which, which is very different, which is uh, for uh, medical uh, drug discovery. And we worked with that team to reduce the time to train their protein model from 11 days to 67 hours. And so this is AlphaFold, which is a, uh, used for the biomedical industry. Our new system is called FastFold. And it uses a custom system. It doesn't use exactly what I've talked about before. It, so it, has, it uses something called dynamic axis parallelism, which is based on the specific computational features of the model of AlphaFold. So unlike traditional tensor parallelism, what we do is dynamic axis parallelism. And that divides the data in the sequence direction, you know, the length of the protein of AlphaFold's features, and uses all-to-all -all communication. And we you know, combine it with other things like duality async to better overlap computation and communication, and some other you know, specialized optimizations that are specifically for AlphaFold. And we can reduce the training time, as I said, from 11 days to 67 hours. And the inference, we got to speed up of anywhere from 7.5 up to 9.5. And you know, in this uh, inference scenario, we've done a lot of additional work that's uh, customized, and we're happy to work with you on that. Um, so we, for example, we use Triton to you know, optimize the kernel and you know, to the flash attention uh, layer and the fast norm layer. And by reducing the memory consumption, we could deal with sequences up to a length of 10,000. So why was 10,000 the goal? That covers almost all proteins. 99.999% you know, of all proteins can be done this way now. And that gave us an overall 5x speed up, which made them very happy. So last slide, thank you very much for your time. If you're interested and want to know more about Colossal AI, you can scan the QR code and join our Slack team and start the GitHub. Um, it's still under continuous development and optimization. And if you're interested in getting involved with the project for your special model, uh, uh, you're welcome to contribute. And don't hesitate to let us know. Thank you very much.